You know those movies that you see at the dollar store? The ones that you never knew existed, but have one or two actors you kind of recognize? Well, most of them are free on YouTube with ads, so I'm going to watch a bunch and share my thoughts. Welcome to Bargain Bin. So today's movie is Halo Legends, and it's not so much a movie as it is seven unrelated episodes of a show smashed together for a length of time. The short films in the movie were made by six different animation houses in Japan. The initial scripts and outlines for the shorts were created by Frank O'Connor from 343, and then he just let the animation studios do their thing. I'll definitely say which studios did what as we go, so with that being said, let's get right into Halo Legends. The first bit of the movie is as close to a Halo documentary as I've ever seen. The episodes Origin 1 and 2 were animated by Studio 4 Degrees Celsius. I have to be honest, I didn't recognize any of their work before or since, but they've worked on a decent amount of stuff, so definitely check them out. This episode takes place after the events of Halo 3, so Cortana is talking to a very frozen Master Chief. She starts to think back on everything that's happened to then, all the way back to the Forerunners. This is awesome because even with all of the Halo I've played, I was still pretty fuzzy on the Forerunners and their role in everything. Well, it turns out they were an incredibly advanced and prosperous civilization, and at the height of this, they were attacked by the Flood. They underestimated the Flood at first, and it would prove to be a fatal mistake. The parasitic Flood had quickly spread, destroying life on planets and gaining the knowledge of whoever they consumed. The war that followed was devastating, and eventually the Forerunners realized that they could not beat the Flood. So they developed the Halo Rings, super weapons that had the power to cleanse the galaxy of intelligent life. They activated the Rings, and the Flood was wiped out, but so was everything and everyone else. To combat this, the Forerunners took samples from many species and used robots to plant seeds of life on planets, so that life in the galaxy could grow to what it once was, and to even more without the threat of the Flood. Origins Part 2 focuses on the rise of humans, a race which developed a taste for war pretty early on. Humans fought on Earth for land and power, but eventually they realized that they were fighting for a planet that could no longer sustain the growing human population. So humans collectively looked up to the sky for something more out in the stars. A time of peace followed because all humans were sharing a common goal. A goal that once reached allowed them to flourish in space. But human nature doesn't change and eventually someone had something that someone else wanted and once again war broke out. Old resentments and dead conflicts came back to the surface and time had circled back to repeat itself. And it actually happened in more ways than one because something was on the way that would unite humanity once again in a common goal. Survival. The fight was on, and all of the weapons developed to kill other humans were now turned to these alien invaders. But that wasn't the end of it, because all of the new fighting and commotion stirred something out of its slumber, and quietly while the rest of the galaxy fought, the Flood returned. The Flood grew so powerful so quickly that humans in the Covenant had a temporary truce to try and fight off this new enemy. Fighting and dying alongside each other actually created a bond between humans and the Covenant, and the temporary truce turned into a permanent alliance. And that leads us neatly up to the time that this episode is based in. In humanity's quest to learn everything about the galaxy, they learn that the galaxy is impossibly large, and for every beauty, there are dark, hidden secrets and some of these secrets should never be known. Cortana ends her musing and begins to talk to the Master Chief directly. Also, somehow she wipes some frost away from the glass. I don't know how that happened. But while looking at him, she wonders if there will always be warriors, and she thinks yes. They will always need warriors, because there will always be war. The next episode is called The Duel, and it was made by Production ID. From them, you may recognize Blood Sea, Great Pretender, or Vampire in the Garden. The episode itself is a cool bit of background on the race of the elites, but I was not a fan of the animation style. The whole time, things looked grainy and dull to me. I feel like some of the backgrounds and rooms they put in the episode could easily fit into Final Fantasy IX. But anyway, it tells the story of an Arbiter 
not the one we've come to know and love, but someone named Fal, who held the title sometime before. When the Covenant was recruiting races, they actually had trouble with the elites, and that was because of Fal. He doesn't believe in the Covenant religion, and does not want him or his people to follow it. A prophet in the Covenant sees this as heresy, and begins to immediately pull strings to ruin Fal's name. But Fal isn't going to back down, so they need him dead. There's a fight scene where Fal takes on a bunch of Covenant, and I have to be honest, Hunter should not be this big, but it looks pretty awesome. And he basically goes into Madara mode when he's fighting them. I was getting flashbacks from the fourth great ninja war. Anyway, while he's fighting them, a team goes to his house with the intent of killing his wife. The guy there says he's doing this so Fal will fight him, but if he was on this battlefield instead of doing that, I still feel like he would have gotten his way. But he isn't there and does kill Fal's wife, and which, yeah, that pisses him off. So that leads to the duel the episode is named after. And for a while they stand there, which builds up the suspense, but then it's over in one strike. Like I said earlier, the animation wasn't great in my opinion, but the story had some interesting implications. It leads me to think that even if a race is with the Covenant, that doesn't make them evil. Obviously, the prophets don't take no for an answer, so I think it's completely fair to think that some of the races could have been forced into the religion. It also suggests that the rot could start with the leaders of a race, and the soldiers beneath them are only following orders and believe it is to benefit their planet or race. Maybe it's nothing, but I've always liked things that point out that the Covenant maybe isn't so cut and dry. Moving on to the next episode, it is called Homecoming, and it was made by B-Train Studios. A studio that I think went out of business because they have no credits past 2011. In the beginning of the episode, we see a group of UNSC soldiers pinned down by Covenant Fire. A Spartan code named Daisy shows up to get them moving and to the evac location. As she's helping them in the fight, Daisy has flashbacks to her days training in the Spartan program. At one point, I guess she decided that she wanted out, and she tries to go back to what was once her home. When she gets there, she sees someone who looks exactly like her. Turns out the Spartan program is so secretive that they made clones to replace all of the children they took. This obviously upsets Daisy, so she points her gun at the clone to take her place, but isn't able to pull the trigger. The clone gives her a bear that belonged to the real Daisy as a child, and Daisy unfortunately realizes that the life she once had doesn't belong to her anymore. So she turns around and makes her way back to the Spartan training. Back on the battlefield, Daisy has managed to get the Marines to the extraction, but their Warthog is blown up right before they can get there. All the Marines get inside the Pelican, but Daisy gets shot and tells them to go on ahead. I'm not sure if there's any kind of personal relationship between her and the soldiers, but they don't leave and begin to provide covering fire. Unfortunately, they're overwhelmed and the Pelican blows up, killing everybody. Later on when things are quiet, Master Chief is walking through the battlefield and he comes across Daisy, who is dead on the ground. He sees the bear on the ground beside her, and before moving on, the Chief puts it into her hands. I thought this episode was effective because it showed the length that the military will go through for the Spartan program, and also drives home the point that when you become a Spartan, you become a different person. Enough of the heavy stuff though. The next episode is a lot of fun. It's called Odd One Out, and it's kind of a parody of the Halo universe. It does have Spartans, but it also has super-powered humans and a hard-hitting fight scene. See if you can guess the animation studio that put this one together. That's right, if you didn't already guess, this was made by the absolute legends at Toei Animation. 
the studio that's brought us the Dragon Ball series, Neon Genesis, One Piece, and so many more. The song I used just then was actually the theme song for Trafalgar Law in One Piece, so a little bit of an extra hint if you caught it. I actually recognized the style about halfway through the episode, and I was pretty excited by that. I don't want to say much about this episode because I would recommend that everybody watch this, if not the whole movie. It's about as close to a real Halo anime as we might ever get, and it has all of the great humor and action that Toei has become known for. Moving on to the next episode, it is called Prototype, and it was made by Studio Bones, and they are another heavy hitter in the anime world. I'm sure at this point everyone knows My Hero Academia, well that's them. And they've also made Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood, Mob Psycho 100, Soul Eater, and one of my favorite shows, Space Dandy. Seriously, watch this if you haven't. The episode itself follows a marine demo team as they're sent to destroy a prototype weapons facility so the Covenant can't take it over. In the beginning, we see the commander of the unit, Ghost, three years ago as the last of his earlier squad died in his arms. But now back in current time, the marines are struggling to take back and destroy the facility. A retreat is called, but the unit is pinned down and can't escape. Ghost is missing while his unit is being bombarded, but he isn't going to let another one of his units get wiped out. So he hops into a heavy mech suit prototype and joins the fight. He tells his squad to go ahead, and then he begins his assault. And boy is it one. We also get a bit of backstory in the banter. He got the name Ghost because, as a commander, his orders were seen as cold but calculated, and people felt that emotions just pass right through him. But he laments that when he lost his last unit, that was what really broke him. And that's when he really became Ghost. Just a shadow that breathes. His orders were to destroy the suit, and he knew that putting it on would mean that he would be inside when that happens. Before that does happen, though, he truly lays waste to a lot of the Covenant force. But, after a barrage of plasma shots and a grenade, he loses his arm and the suit struggles to move. Ghost triggers the self-destruct and is able to save his unit, and the mission is a success. The soldier I previously recommended for military court-martial is... I rescind and redact that portion of my earlier report. That soldier is officially missing in action, lost during heavy combat on Algolus. He demonstrated honorable conduct not only as a Marine, but also as a human being. We're heading for rendezvous with the UNSC Heart of Midlothian. Over and out. This one hit pretty hard for how short it was. I've read the Fall of Reach book. And something the side Halo stories are so good at is giving faceless soldiers a name and story. When playing Halo 1 through 3, the Marines will join you, but that's all they are. They're just Marines with a name. And on top of that, Master Chief is the perfect soldier and rarely shows emotion. Because of that, I think it's easy to forget that the Marines and commanders in this universe are real people and the victories and failures of their lives and their careers stay with them. I think stories like this one just make the Halo universe that much better. Speaking of giving soldiers personalities, the next episode is The Babysitter, and this one was animated by Studio 4 Degrees Celsius again. This is their second episode they animated along with Origins, and yeah, you can, you can see it in their style. The Babysitter follows a group of ODST Helljumpers, and as they sit in the cafe, we learn their sniper is being made a backup sniper and being replaced by a Spartan. They don't go into it much here, but there is actually a stigma and maybe a bit of hatred between ODST and Spartans. Their team's mission is to reach and document some kind of architecture that predates humans and the Covenant. They're going to be dropping alongside a meteor shower to avoid detection. As they're entering the atmosphere, one ODST loses his life because his pod burns up, and a second, the backup sniper, lands in a swamp. He's rescued by the Spartan, but isn't grateful. They set out and come up on what seems to be a large town. They stealthily take down a couple of grunts, but one of the ODSTs step on a stick, and a brute attacks from behind. 
He's saved by the Spartan, nicknamed Cal, so I'll just say that from now on. And they begin to fight. Because of the force of the hammer, the Odieski sniper is sent flying and out over a waterfall. Cal is still fighting the brute and is able to land a punch, then some nasty kicks, which sends the brute over the falls as well. But luckily the ODST hung on long enough to be rescued and then cradled by Cal. Saved twice now and still no thank you. They set up in a sniping position as a dropship comes in with their target, but the brute from earlier is still alive and attacks them from behind. Cal takes the hit fully and because of that, the ODST are able to take down the brute. Cal isn't able to make the shot, so she tells the sniper to, and he absolutely nails this guy. It was a great shot. Cal knows what's coming, so she hands over the data they collected and dies from her wounds. Now with the mission complete, they're back where they started, and a marine comes over to congratulate them, but he also begins to shit-talk Cal, which now the ODSTs won't stand for. So this episode had a bit less to add to the lore, but I was happy to see some hell jumpers in one of the episodes. That was unexpected. I think this one in particular didn't do much for me, because it's a bit of a played-out story. New team member, isn't accepted at first, but sacrifices themselves for the team, making the team regret how they treated said person. Seen it before. And now we're on to the last episode, and this one is called Package, and it looks like it could have been a cutscene in one of the Halo games. It was made by Casio Entertainment, who only worked on this and a Final Fantasy movie. First we see some Spartans getting briefed about a package that needs to be extracted from a Covenant fleet. Master Chief is among them, and he's leading the mission. The team make their way to the fleet, dodging plasma rounds as they go. I have to say, the animation here is pretty cool, and it reminds me of the first scene in Revenge of the Sith. They see a beacon for the package, so Solomon, one of the Spartans, checks out his ship. The bomb he thought was the package explodes, killing him. Gotcha, Kelly, it's a trap. <laughs> as they start heading there, another Spartan, Arthur, gets smushed between two Covenant ships and is also lost. Kelly loses her ship, but is able to jump onto another one and takes control of the rear turret. Master Chief is able to create an opening in one of the landing bays, and they make a badass entrance. There are dozens of Covenant, all with their guns trained on them, but these three are about to show what it means to be a Spartan. Them barreling through the ship goes on for a while, and it's a treat to watch. The Spartan named Fred stays behind to give them cover with just a knife while Master Chief and Kelly continue on. The Covenant commander starts to break off blocks of the flagship to stop them, and it forces them to jump for the main block. Kelly throws Master Chief ahead, and he ends up being the only one that makes it inside. Once he's in there, he's able to locate the package, which is Dr. Halsey herself. As they're making their escape, they're stopped by the Major, and the Master Chief is challenged to a plasma sword duel. It doesn't get to finish because the commander decides to break off the rest of the ship and jump through slip space. Now that the ship has no way to control its directions, they need to find a way out, and they do in an escape pod. The Covenant begins to chase them, but thankfully, they're rescued by Fred who was not killed in the hallway. Turns out that Kelly lived as well, so they only had two casualties during the mission, being Solomon and Arthur. And that's the episode, a pretty action-packed one, which was fun. I'm not 100% sure, but this really reminded me of the last chapter in Fall of Reach. And if that's true, the Spartans in this were part of Master Chief's squad in the original Spartan program. Again, I read it a long time ago, so not sure, but it was cool to be reminded of it. This one was interesting because it seemed like a cutscene in a Halo game. And not just the 3D animation bit, but also, I feel like to understand everything, you, you needed at least a couple hours of gameplay and cutscenes before this. It just really felt like something you were jumping into right in the middle. That being said though, I think this episode can be enjoyed for the action alone, because it was very well done. And that's all of the episodes. The movie is done. I would recommend this to any fan of the Halo universe. 
I played all of the games and read some books. I haven't seen the show, but from what I've heard, I can still keep my Halo card. The thing I liked about this was how different all of the episodes looked while still feeling like Halo. Even when Toei went wild and did their thing, it still felt like Halo. When you have a lore and a universe so large, it's easy to make stories because all you have to do is keep pointing the flashlight in other places. Even a single character on a planet no one has ever heard of. Something showing how events in the universe and how the war in general affects their lives could be interesting. And it could be pretty easy to connect them to something larger if it's something that people recognize like a turning point in the war or some other event. I may just speak for myself, but if there was a book about a janitor that worked on Reach when it fell, I'd be all over that. Honestly, I think this movie could act as a lesson for some when it comes to doing something different and taking risks, but also staying true to the lore. And when it's connecting to things in the larger universe, then it's incentive for people to dive deeper in. That is what I think Halo Legends did very well. And that's all I've got for today. Thank you for watching. I know it's been a while since the last bargain bin, but I've just been judging them too harshly. Like the last two I scrapped because I hated them. But that's why I chose Halo Legends, because I knew it would be something that I like. I do hope to have another one out soon. I've got some other movies chosen for videos. But until then, again, thank you for watching, and until next time.